this, 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 this show is brought to you by Safety FM. What's up, peeps? Welcome back to Rebranding Safety. Today, we're continuing on our Safety 1 and Safety 2 mini-series. Let's jump into the intro and I'll tell you some more. The problem in safety isn't deviation, it's complexity. Health and safety has gone mad. Health and safety is trying to unpick having gone mad in the past. There's no one solution and one problem. The problem is that we are looking for one solution. Does the structure of the team allow them to flourish? Feel safe enough to be uncomfortable. The environment defines our behaviours. People aren't the problem, they're the solution. Rebranding safety, crushing the stereotype. Brought to you by Risk Fluent. What's up peeps, welcome back to Rebranding Safety. Rebranding Safety is the YouTube channel and podcast doing exactly what it says on a team. We're here to change the perception of health and safety. And we do that here on the podcast and we do that on YouTube. So if you're new here, hit those buttons, whether it's subscribe, follow, whatever it is on the platform you're listening. It does all good and magical things on the algorithms and all that. So hit it, do us a flavor and hit that button. Let's get into today's episode then. We are talking to Kevin Furness. Quite a bit of a legend in the safety two space, if you want to call it that. And we're talking about how it kind of done it in real life at Maersk, Maersk, Maersk. I think it's Maersk, Maersk, the shipping company, you know, the big international shipping company. You see it on all those big containers, like some big risks, you know, big international ships ping and, you know, big nasty weather and waves and all this stuff some real nasty stuff that kevin has to deal with in this role and he's kind of brought this safety to um way of thinking into his business he talks about it and the journey and how he's going to do that so we're going to talk about that today in the episode so i'm not going to talk too much about it because i'll spoil the episode and also i'm not going to talk too much about it because i'll spoil next week's episode where i reflect on my chat with kevin furness so don't forget to go buy yourself some merch, www.rebrandingsafety.com and get yourself some cool ass t-shirts, some cool ass jumpers, um, mugs and tote bags as well for all those events that you're currently not going to. But you can buy yourself a tote bag, put some magazines in it and a couple of pens and you'll feel like you're there. Just walk around, have some conversation with people and pretend that you're interested in something and they can sell it to you and you can, you know, just walk away and they can be like, oh my God, I think I've got a sale. Unbeknownst to them, you're just there for the free pen because that's really all we go there for, you know, stocking up on your annual stationery. That's it. So do that. Buy yourself a tote bag, fill it with some pens, walk around the house, get your kids and wives to set up like some little, little booths or something or your husband or... However, however, your household is set up and just get some little booze going, get the family involved, be nice and fun. And you could satisfy your, your kind of need to go to an event. Hmm. If anyone actually does that, let me know, because I'd, I'd be quite intrigued as to whether it was fun or whether it was just a complete waste of your time. Either way, buy some merch. OK, let's jump into the episode. I'll stop waffling on. OK, um... Interesting. I mean, I think I guess the first thing is how did I how did I get into safety? Um, I grew up in a, a very small mining town in the north of England, and my father was responsible for a group of men who had to go down um, down, down the pit every day. And um, yeah, you know, he was uh, always drilling into me. that a good day at work for him was when uh, all the men got out of the mines safely, and that, and that sort of stuck with me throughout uh, my, my my teenage years, really. And then he was doing Doing, always doing safety qualifications and things like this and I would sit there reading his textbooks and testing him on on questions and I guess that's where it sparked my interest um, and then I, I sort of moved away into uh, into more in, a related industry really into mines and quarries uh, and went to work as a chemist I never envisaged myself to, to be a safety professional when I started out and then in um, uh, 19, about the back end of 1987, I guess it was then, when the kosher eggs first sort of were muted, that uh, the, uh, the mines and quarries inspector threw a, a draft document on the boss, on my boss's desk, who was the quarry manager, around control of hazardous substances. And uh, he called me up and he said, uh, get your backside up here, I've got something for you. And I, I guess that's where my, my real interest in, in safety started um, back in uh, with the Koshrex in, in, in 1988. 
And ever since then, I've had a, I've been lucky enough to have a fairly varied and, uh, and quite an interesting career around the world, helping organisations get uh, achieve their ambitions and become a, a safer place to work. Um, whether it's been in manufacturing, engineering, whether it's been in aerospace, in construction, um, uh, whether it worked for um, the UK government at the time for the Olympics, uh, worked in technology sector with Vodafone and the motor industry with BMW and Jaguar Land Rover, and more recently in the uh, in, in the maritime industry with with Maersk for the last sort of six and a half years. So I guess in in a couple of minutes, James, that's uh, that's me really. That's quite impressive. You did actually just cram that into like a real a real short uh, a short couple of minutes for quite an extensive <laughs> career. Well done. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, I don't think people are interested in my background. They probably hear what I want, what I've got to say, or what I'm interested in. So it, I thought I'd always, keep it short. It's always interesting when you ask people to introduce themselves. They either just say, "Hi, I'm I'm Kevin, and I work at Mask," or or you get like a, a nice a nice little well packaged kind of introduction like yours was, or you just get like yeah. a life story. I think I'm probably a life story <laughs> person. I, I like a story. So when someone says, you know, give me an introduction to yourself, James, I'm like, well, I was born in Kettering General Hospital in Northamptonshire on the 14th. Of <laughs> <laughs> it was a summer's day. <laughs> yeah. People, people, people who've had the, um, I, I won't call it fortune, probably misfortune of knowing me for any length of time over my, my time in the world will know that I, um, I, I don't beat around the bush with one or two things. So I like <laughs> to get to the point. Well, on that note, let's let's get to the point. So I um I invited you on the podcast after I listened yeah. to your uh let's let let's say digital keynote essentially it was for the HSE Congress where you talked about um let, let's go let's call it safety two for now we you know we're, we're not going to get into okay. an argument over over what, what it is or safety one versus safety two but let's just call it safety two for the argument of this uh for the for the ease of this conversation um sure. so you'd implemented this kind of safety two uh, mindset or or kind of system or whatever you want to call it in mask and Am I saying that right? Remind me, how do I pronounce mask? It's AP Muller mask. Yeah. Mask. yeah, it's a bit of a strange mask, right? So, yeah, it's pretty yeah. good. Because if I don't check, I'll just say it like 20 different ways throughout the whole podcast and that'll just be embarrassing. So we'll go with mask. So um, I'm interested to kind of talk around that. And and your, your kind of presentation was, to be honest, you know, hats off to you. It was flawless. It was a very, very good presentation. It was well yeah it was just flawless like the one bit i tell you, just just a bit of feedback for yourself the one bit that i was most impressed by is when you played the video at the end you didn't say i'm just going to play a video you just played the video and i was like nice that was slick it was <laughs> very nice Thanks. so a bit, a bit of feedback for you there it was i was very impressed um so in it, anyway um ha, let, let, i want to i want to talk through that journey so let, let's kind of let's start with with maybe maybe the differences like the key differences of where you were before and then we'll get into where you are now but like where you were before and then kind of what was the point where you thought we we need something else does that make sense was there like a key event yeah well i i are we talk i mean in, in 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 my in my career i think if you go back about um 10 years then um John Green and I were, were talking about this when we were both um, still working in and around uh, the UK at the time. And John and I both spent some time at Langer Rourke together, and, and John went off to to Australia. And we were thinking, uh, even back in the you know in in, in um, sort of a decade ago, about something's not right here with safety. You know, we've we've got all this, and John starts to talk about you know. Um, um, next gear and moving where we were in terms of thinking about the opportunities because even back then if you looked at industry generally you know the the, the level of improvement that we were seeing even even back in the construction industry we'd done all the right things for a number of years and the accidents just weren't getting any better you know the the, mm. the lost time injury frequency rates and things like that were just stagnant doesn't matter what we do we couldn't seem to break this this sort of plateau this flattening off of this curve and then John and I sort of, as we normally do, we went our separate ways. I went off to Vodafone and he went to Australia for a while. And he called me up um, and he said, I've got it. I've met some guys and I've talked about this and I think they are talking about the same thing we're talking about. 
And that's when we, we, we started really seriously, I seriously started to, to look at this and going, is there something in this? Because I'll be honest, you know, it, it, it was 10 years ago and I was still like probably everyone else thinking that mm. we, were, we were just in a space where we weren't very good at this and we just needed to do the same things but better. And, and I think what I've realized over the last, particularly seven years, I would say, James, is, is that that's not the answer, you know, and, and, and doing, doing things better, smarter, faster, harder in the same way is, is not really what's going to make the difference now. The world's changed. And yet, you know, I looked at what we were doing and I, I thought, well, you know, is this really going to solve the problem? And then working in the technology sector with, with Vodafone, I had the opportunity to listen to um, the CEO of Google and he, he sort of came out with, with one thing that really resonated with me and has stuck with me ever since. And he was asked a question in, um, in, in one keynote that he did that I was fortunate enough to listen to. And um, his response was, well, we're trying to solve 21st century challenges with 20th century thinking yeah and yeah. all of a sudden that penny dropped in my head right and it's like i get it now i think he's on to something and i'm i'm not sure but i think that also applies to where we were in safety because we've had decades of reductionist theory and the same things you know that and, and honestly 10 years ago seven years ago even eight years ago we were still trying to do the same things working in the same way as we had been 10, 15 years previous. I've been in this profession and this career, if you like, for 33 years now. And, you know, and it wasn't until the last, the last eight years or so that I've started to see things differently. So I guess it, from a Merck perspective, then we started to put some of the ideas and ideologies in play within Vodafone in, the, in, in, in that organization. Um, uh, you know, uh, and, and that started to, to to really resonate with people. This idea that you know safety was um, moving away from being compliance driven to being more ethically based and more morals based, and it was about leaders leading differently and people being you know respected and cared for rather than being an asset to be almost used and abused. And, and then we started some of that, but really in Maersk it started by focusing um, the terminals division because the, the term anybody who works in maritime sector will know that um, ports and terminals are, are an extremely dangerous places to work and they have a a, a very sort of um, immature response to safety in whichever organization you work in and this is no different and the industry itself is is like the construction industry before the construction industry changed its attitude and belief and, and what was acceptable and not. So we started there really and did some, did a few things and we started to look at what we called critical controls and saying, if all, when everything else goes wrong, when everything else fails, when all our prevention doesn't work, what do we have? And that was the sort of thinking we, um, we took some inspiration from a, a colleague who helped us out and we, they, uh, they coined this phrase, the fatal five. And it was all about looking at, you know, the, your, your critical risks of your operation, not holding handrails, not wearing PPE, not doing risk assessments. Like, what's the stuff that kills people? What's the stuff when it really goes wrong is really going to damage your business? And there are always four or five things that, that, that you could probably pick on. And we looked at those and then we looked at, okay, so how good are, are our controls in that space? and started to focus on the effectiveness of controls that allowed us to operate with these critical risks. And the view that I changed from that point, up to that point, I was almost in a belief that you could prevent everything from happening. And the honest reality is that you start to realize that you can't, that you're always going to have to work at 75 meters high or you're going to have to lift things that weigh 40 tons or you're going to have to have big cranes that move stuff and you're going to have to put people at sea which in itself is a dangerous thing so you cannot prevent that you can't stop that and there's no real innovation and technology and even today right the 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 uh, the, uh, the technological advances we have and the, the, the almost the fourth industrial revolution is is really that um you can't eliminate everything and you can't prevent everything. So you have to find a way of 
building resilience or, or building capacity so as you're able to carry out those tasks in a way that when it fails not if it fails but when it fails that people don't get seriously injured or killed as a result of doing work and that's where we really started it that's the sort of was started with the main thrust um, but then you quickly realize that that's just if you like focusing on stuff we've already been doing through risk assessment and as good as that was it only really got us 20 percent of the way so we started to ask ourselves what's going to take us you know more cl closer to to the destination closer to our ambition and we realized then that if you talk to the employees and the people who are really at the sharp end of your business um, what matters to them is how they are respected believed understood listened to and then you explore that a little more and you find that they don't trust leaders they don't trust your supervisors they don't trust management generally because they don't live in the real world, according to them. So you get this view that says workers see managers as, as the problem and managers see workers as the problem. Hmm. And neither group are right. The real problem is that you know, there's a work as we imagine it and then there's the reality of getting the job done. And I think that was the first sort of opening of my eyes and it's been reinforced by others after. That, you know with work that that Holnagel did and Decker and the whole sort of safety to movement around you know this 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 work in reality versus work as we imagine it and that meant that leaders had to lead differently because instead of sitting in their office and telling workers what to do and being the fountain of all knowledge they, they really had to turn themselves into a, a different person and get out there and be humble and actually you know be vulnerable and mm -hmm. say please tell me how our business works uh, and, and that was a, a, a huge, a huge change um, in, in the thinking. So when you start to reposition safety as, you know, about the people, so it's a, a people subject that has technical aspects and not the way we were tackling it previously, which was it was a bureaucratic, technical, procedural driven uh, management system focused exercise that involved people. Then you have a different focus and a different perspective. And then you start to see, um, you know, different outcomes and different possibilities. Mm. When, when you, you just quickly said that <clears throat> you mentioned like getting to your, your, your aim, your ambition, what, what, what was that? What was the, the, the aim and ambition? Was it, was it like a, a, quant a quantitative kind of thing where you were looking at it like we, we just want to stop our fatal fatalities, our fatal incidents? Or was it, was it more kind of quant qualitative where you were more um, kind of feedback from people and how people perceive the business or was it neither of those? Well, like everybody else, I mean, we started from a position where we believed that um, less accidents equals more safety. And I think mm. we've um, unlearned, unlearned that over the last sort of six and a half, seven years. And actually, you know, with help from others and listening and, and actually doing our own research, um, to actually say, you know what, that's not right. And like most other organizations, um, we had, you know, um, an accident-free workplace, zero accidents, call it what you will, as our ambition. And it took an awful lot of um, pain and suffering on behalf of my team and the people that I worked with and, uh, you know, some of our senior leaders that, that, that got that, that said, we need to change this. So we went from a position of, putting safety as numbers on a scorecard and measuring people against it. And, and let's be honest, our organization was no different to every other, which is like very, very seduced by numbers and, you know, wants to, wants to put a square peg in a square hole because it fits nicely and it fits a box on a spreadsheet and they can go do a good PowerPoint presentation with it <laughs> to one that's something a little bit more visionary, a little bit more filler, uh, sort of ideological in that space. And we went away from numbers completely and said, when people said, oh, what's your safety ambition? It's Maersk is a safe place to work. We, we took this concept of, of moving away from accidents and zero fatalities to the board and said, um, our ambition should be to make Maersk a safe place to work. And one of the senior leaders in the board meeting at the time said, I don't get it. I don't understand it. 
It's like, well, what is it? What does it mean to you? And then you know, he provided me with a, a wonderful sort of intellectual response around what, what safety meant. But oh, right. So yeah, it's this, this and this. And he gave me some another good example. And then I said, okay, do you think that um, a crew member of one of our ships working in the engine room sees it exactly that way? Or the guys or girls working in the terminals lifting containers in cranes or in trucks every day? And he went, no. I said, do you think it means something different to that? And he went, yeah. And you could see immediately the light bulb going on. And the one thing that changing our view and changing our ambition away from one that was driven by numbers and the absence of something like negatives to actually a statement like Maersk is a safe place to work. It started a conversation because what it meant to me and what it meant to the board members and what it means to people working at the sharp end, whatever job they do is a very personal thing. And the one thing I've always struggled with is we've always talked about making safety personal and yet then we generalize everything. You know, we, we come out with these wonderful glib statements around, oh yeah, make safety personal. How did you do it? Because safety is an in the moment thing. It's not something that you write, something that's static. It changes constantly. And if you want to be relevant to people and get them on board and engage with them and get them to tell you the reality of work, then safety is something that changes by the minute depending on what task they're doing, what context they're in, what situation they're in, what external or internal influences there are. And yet, when, I, when we looked at it across MERS, we were still, still using, if you like, rigid, inflexible, um, old-fashioned type ways of managing safety. And I think that was one of the big things that we, we looked at and changed our philosophy was that this had to be about the people and not about the, the efficacy of a process or a management system. Mm. That's, that's fascinating. How, how did that, that, that couldn't have been like an overnight thing where the board were just like, yeah, cool, stop telling us about accidents and incidents and reporting, you know, stop sending us our, our lovely pie charts that, that tell us how good or bad we are. That must have been like a, a painful journey for quite a while like surely that was a big, quite a big adjustment period for the board to to not get these kind of traditional safety reports of incidents and accidents and stuff like that yeah i mean to be honest james i mean it was nine months it really took us nine months of thinking and conversations and and and, and meetings and discussions with board members and writing papers and producing evidence back to to back up the theories and even sometimes you know you have to go out and, and go get someone else and we uh, we grabbed todd todd conklin who we'd seen at um, oil and gas norway previously in our drilling company and said sometimes they don't even want to your your own bosses don't want to hear it from uh, from me even though I could tell them the same message, they want to hear it from somebody outside because, you know, they might know that a little bit more. So we, we, we weren't proud. We, we dragged anybody and anybody who could add something to our argument and dragged them in and said, even if, you know, just come and present to our board, come and talk to them. And we got away from this, it has to be me that does this. It has to, you know, because if my credibility is shot as, as Kevin working in Maersk, if, if I can't answer the question. And that wasn't really the, the thing that we were showing. It was that, you know, we want you to understand that this is, this is new and it's, uh, you know, it's going to take some getting used to. And over the period of nine months and different um, ways of socializing the whole ideology and the thinking behind it, we, uh, we started to turn people and then they started to listen to us a little more. And you started to see a new language appearing. You know, we, we actually wrote some narratives and put things out there. And without, without really expecting it to go anywhere, we just sort of like threw some corn down to see what happened. And then one day we were watching um, one of our um, uh, senior executives, I think it was Soren Toft at the time, who happened to be on... Uh, uh, CNBC, I think it was doing something, and they were talking about accidents at work and this that, and the other. And and he just came out with this thing that said, "What matters to us is that Merck's a safe place to work." And all of a sudden, you went, "Actually, 
you've started to see it. You've started to, people are buying it and they're changing their language. But it was a transformation, James, over, and it still is over a longer period. This is not something that, you know, you, you stop doing one day, you stop doing safety one one day, you start doing safety two the next day. It is, it, it's a, it's sort of a hybrid you go through in terms of not throwing away, you know, the baby with the bathwater, so to speak. So not everything you've done in, in the old way is like wrong. Nobody's ever said that in this safety to movement. It's all been about making sure that what we are doing is, is making the workplaces safer and not just doing the work of safety, not just, you know, making ourselves look good on a piece of paper, but achieving nothing. And, and that to me was, was nine months of intense pain and hard work. And, you know, and it's not over now. You still have to keep having the energy and the enthusiasm for it. And it's hard work. You know, there's no, there's no easy route to this. It's just hard yards. There, there's, there's no substitute for the, so the, the socializing. There's no substitute for the courage that you need to keep correcting every time one of your leaders starts talking about accidents again. And trust me, that still happens in our business today. We still have people, you know, who haven't quite grasped it yet. And the one thing you can't do is let it go. You, know, you, you have to have that conversation every time somebody writes it down or accidentally says something or one of your corporates. Uh, communication partners, you know, who actually writes a wonderful piece and then just happens to forget that they're supposed to be doing a different language and they just come out with the old easy to trip off the tongue rubbish that we've been doing for the last 30 years. So it is hard every day. I wouldn't say that we finished it, but we're a long way forward that I'm very comfortable that um, our CEO can talk about um, the way we believe and what we believe to be true about safety now without me writing him a script. He will go out and he can talk about this from what it means to him personally and what Mercy is a safe place to work means for him. Mm. And that's an achievement in its own right, I suppose, isn't it? I think that's the dream of any safety professional that your CEO, managing director, whatever they're called, can can have a conversation around safety within their business without feeling like they need to have their hand held by the safety professional or a script written or some pie charts behind them. I think that's an achievement in its own right. You, um, you alluded to it there, but like, um, I'd, I'd like to kind of explore that a little bit more when you mentioned that we, you know, it's not about just destroying everything from this safety one world. It was this, this gradual kind of transition and, and the way I kind of look at it and the way, and, and I'd be interested to see what you think, but when, when people talk to me about it and they say, what do you think? Should we get rid of everything? I think at least in the beginning, it's more, it's not just chucking everything out. It's asking the question, is this actually providing us value towards whatever our aim or objective is? So, you know, if your ambition, like you say, was to make mask a safe place to work, then does this piece of paper, does this management system, does this checklist, whatever we're talking about, does that get us to that point? It's, it's not like, I think there is this perception that, right, today we're going to safety too, um, and that means we're, we're just going to throw out everything. We're just destroying everything that we've got. And I think that's why a lot mm. of business leaders and a lot of safety professionals as well probably seem very – there's a huge divide and i think a lot of it is driven by fear like this kind of well hang on a minute you want to go to a world where we've got no evidence no paperwork no management systems and it's like well maybe that's not really what we're saying yeah i i i, I do agree a lot that in, in two things james firstly is i don't believe that um, like like the video says at the end of the presentation I did last week, and if anybody wants to see it, they should get onto HSC Network and potentially go have a look at it. Because it is about, you know, the, this whole mindset shift of you can't go halfway with this. You've got to go all the way. Because this is about organizational change. It's not about safety culture. It's about how your leaders lead, how you engage, how you build trust with employees. And at no point during this, this journey, have we talked really about safety other than building capacity? The way we talk to our leaders, what we talk to them about is how to understand the real work in the business. We talk to employees around, you know, what makes work 
easy for you and what makes it difficult? What challenges do you face? What do you need? What would be better? You know, we don't talk to them in a, in a way that says, you must do this, and you must follow this rule, and you must have this procedure. What, what we also found was that um, when we talk to our teams and we talk to our workers and even talk to the masters of some of our vessels and uh, some of the, the, the MDs of our operations in terminals, what they tell us is there's just too much safety paperwork. Safety for them is about completing processes and ticking boxes and um, checklists and forms for this and doing that. And then when they've done that, they go and get on with the job, right? Mm -hmm. So they see that we have positioned the, the, the driver of management systems and everything else that we thought was the answer to this, to drive standardization and you know, to, to drive um, repeat behaviors, has actually created, in my view, a situation where it's almost a precursor to, to work going on and then it's forgotten about, then work goes on. And, and there's a lot of good things around having structure and systems and order, but a lot of that is non-value non adding. I'll give you an example. So when we went firstly into, into MESC in, uh, in, in 2014 in the terminals business, and at that point, I think um, they, they, we, we had something like, just in the terminals division alone, there's something like 38 procedures for safety alone, depending on what you were doing. And there were another 14 in the offing already to be launched in 2014. And I basically said, well, stop it. We're not going to do it. And, you know, that was like, blasphemy it was i was hauled in with the my colleagues on the senior leadership team saying what are you doing you know you're going to kill more people and, and everything else and, and to be honest um nothing happened we took them all the way and we focused on two or three things and all these other rules and procedures that we took away um there was no impact there was no change we didn't improve anything well we did but you know safety didn't get any worse as a result of it what what we then managed to prove was that that was just doing safety work right it wasn't making work safe yeah and so so what makes work safe and that's the point that you made where does it add value right mm. what makes this if this is needed because this stops somebody or helps somebody do something or will enable somebody to do something in a different way then it adds value what we found was that more than 80 percent of the administrative burden that we were placing on people who do work, did add no way, added no value at all to mm. making the workplace in which they worked safer. It did everything for making us look good on a piece of paper, especially if you were sat in the safety department. Wow, that's a that's a massive percentage. That's I mean I think I think. Yeah. Our, I think anyone that's kind of opening their eyes to this, this, this kind of newer approach of, of looking at safety wouldn't, would, would, it, would it probably have expected something like that. But that is, that's bigger than what I thought. I was thinking maybe like 60%, but like that is huge. And I think, I think you can see it as well, can't you? In the way we talk about things, it's like when we say like, are you doing, uh, have you done your check? we're not asking have you done your actual safety check we're asking have you done the checklist like the conversation it's always yes. focused on the paperwork and i think the irony of it i think um tanya hewitt shared some of me something with me the other day actually and it was around um i can't remember the name of the guy uh but essentially it was um it was a like a three-way interview you had the interviewer uh a kind of uh I think a solicitor or a lawyer in Australia, and then this uh, uh, like human factors kind of genius. I can't remember any of their names. I'm terrible with names. And essentially, they were talking about paperwork. And it was interesting because the overarching piece of it was something that I've been talking about for a while in that our paperwork does nothing much more than create a false sense of security in a way. Like we, we feel safe. We yeah. think we're safe actually we're not really delivering safety um but i'd be interested to to just kind of get a bit of an insight of what it actually looks like now from from that kind of systems and paperwork point of view i think it, interestingly maybe as a good example would be something like a risk assessment you know we're legally required to risk assess it doesn't necessarily mean we have to have it you know on on paper um 
but it, it what does that look like what does that kind of risk assessing process look like for mess now uh, or, or will it look like going forward or do you... it, 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 I, guess, I guess it differs right because in different legislative geographies then because we operate in you know, 130 countries around the world then yeah. we still have to you know we can't we can't throw away every legal requirement that we have we have to find smarter ways of, of doing things and it's not like having a two-tier system where we have to do the old way to tick a box it's up to us to we, we believe to to influence and drive change and have open dialogues with regulators and with policy makers around you know the reality of work and it's great to see the work particularly in the uk hse are doing and, and you know the uh, the safe work authority in australia and everything and even even osha to some degree coming around to this idea but they still like their statistics. They still like to hang on to data and the old ways. But for us, I mean, it, it is about, we have this, this sort of, um, if you like, underlying philosophy here that we, we need to listen to our, what our crews are telling us. And they're telling us that you give us, what, we can't leave the team safely aboard a, a vessel when you know, we're running a 400 metre vessel with 18,000 containers on it, 400 nautical miles from land. If we're spending all of our time filling in your pieces of paper and ticking your boxes, that's what the captains of the vessels tell us. You know, we need to lead these teams. We need to actually understand, you know, what, what the challenges they're facing and make their work easier for them. And if you took away all this bureaucratic um, s stuff that you ask us to do, we could probably focus a little bit more on that and a little bit less time on, on understanding the... Um, the nuances of your next 14 page procedure on risk assessment and if you think about what we talked about earlier as we say you know safety is dynamic it's not static and risk changes and hazards change and and that's the other thing is we often fall foul of um, you know ticking boxes and following procedures because we have we have something that is rigid that is on rails that has to be done by the book instead of react realizing that things change in the moment and constant sort of whether you call it dynamic risk assessment or whether you call it active monitoring or actually just people aware of the context in which they're operating you know, that's what we're looking for is raising awareness it's not sticking people through a training course it's educating people sometimes just to step back and observe what's going on around them and what the context is and then those decisions that they make to either carry on or stop or do something else is dependent upon you know what the context is at that time and that could be different today versus tomorrow versus the next day so just having a this comfort blanket of yes i've got a nice folder full of risk assessments sat in the safety department's office and you can go and look at it any time or we do method statement briefings you know i've been in that industry i've seen all of that I've, I've listened to the workers telling us we don't understand most of it and and you know another classic example was on the olympic park we had people from all over europe helping us you know regenerate that part of east london and for more than 60% of them, English was a second language or sometimes a third language. So giving them you know, an engineering written technical document that was a method statement that was 114 pages thick, they signed it at the end of the day. They had no clue what they were doing. Mm. And, and this is the problem that we've got ourselves into. This whole safety one theory is that we are, we've believed and, and you know, we've convinced ourselves that that comfort blanket makes sure we're safe. So having all these rules and processes and administrative exercises makes us safe. And, and actually, it's a false sense of security completely. It doesn't. It actually creates more risk than, than, than it's designed, than it was designed to control. And that's dangerous. Yeah, definitely. I would agree. I would agree. That. What, what, but what is it like? I'm just trying to... Get my like for someone who's never worked. I've never worked in that environment. You know, I've only heard of it, read about it, listened to keynotes, had conversations around this kind of safety to businesses and how how we've implemented etc. I'm just fascinated to kind of understand like from from that paperwork point of view, from that records and stuff like that point of view. What does it actually look like? Do you still have the kind of incident reporting systems that we might have in a safety one kind of 
business but you call it something different or 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 do they look completely different it's interesting because on the same day i listened to you actually on the congress i listened to todd conklin and um and since then we've been very lucky to have a conversation with todd as well and um and there's something interesting he said at the con uh, the congress around risk assessments and he said that the problem with risk assessments is when we do them we we balance like this is how i interpreted it what he said but basically i put it on a chat group just to clarify i'd, I'd not not missed the whole point and everyone everyone agreed so it'd be interesting to see what you think but i, I basically said the problem with risk assessment then from what todd is saying is that we, we're balancing the probability of it happening whereas Todd is saying that we should assume it's going to happen and then create the capacity to be able to kind of survive that. So is it the fact exactly. that, yeah. So is it the fact that like you've you've still got risk assessments at mask, but you you're you're looking at them through a different lens? Yeah, I mean we we if, if one thing we've done very recently, one of I mean, just here's a practical example, right? And it's what we call and Todd would call this building capacity, but it is around you know being resilient we have we have big ships and when they are moored um, up against the berth in a port then the way you do that is you use big ropes and they're called mooring lines and there's a lot of tension goes onto these ropes as you can imagine the size of these ships and they're lethal if if a mooring line snaps and you're in the wrong place it will cut you in half you'll be you know dead before you even realize what's going on you'll be in bits and we can't get rid of mooring lines we know mooring lines snap so previously we tackled that with don't be in this area don't do this don't do that it wasn't it was actually trying to control and, and prevent through the we've met and said oh but if what happens if and we're there can we stand here and can we stand there and that got us to a certain level of safety it didn't stop more anything to do with more in line snapping at all so we took a different approach that said let's accept that mooring lines are going to snap what do we need to do to fix it we need a mooring line that doesn't snap back. So we work with a technology company in Germany who developed this system. And we've, we've not sort of moved people out and done that. We've actually said, let's accept it's going to fail. How, when it, when it fails, how do we limit the consequences of that release of kinetic energy? And there's a video out on our website. You can go and look at it with how this company's developed with us. And we're, we're fitting, retrofitting now all 300 of our vessels over time with these new uh, mooring lines that, that will not release kinetic energy. Uh, it's a great video. Um, you can search for it if you just Google uh, mooring line technology and, and you can see it. That's the difference, James, is that we before we've tried to, you know, what's the possibility, probability, how likely is it, what about when you get swell, and try to do that and make that assessment. And we just wasted time. And instead of saying, as Todd rightly says, not if it fails, when it fails, what prevents it from killing somebody? And if the answer is nothing, then you need to, or the answer is we rely on people's training and expertise, then you need to go and have a long, hard look in the mirror because, you know, you need to get your innovation head on and creativity and actually go and find solutions that you can build capacity. And trust me, they're out there. You know, and there's, there's an old adage that says the problem you have, somebody else has already solved. Mm. It might not be directly related, but you can find inspiration and take it. That's what Todd means by building. Um, so, so just to clarify, because I just want to make sure I got this right, because this is where the signal kind of went, that you've re replaced the mooring lines essentially with, with a new technology. So the, kinet the kinetic energy doesn't react when, like it doesn't snap and whip like a like a previous kind of more in line would it instead it would just kind of flops when when it snaps is that correct yeah yeah it, yeah basically yes i mean wow. you you've got like this 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 um five inch rope that's you know if you can imagine a rope it's like four inches thick yeah and it's um, a fixed bollard actually on the key side it's holding the ship you basically got yeah. a rope that is what's hold, you know, the, the, these things down. And um, if the water moves, the ship's going to move and it puts tension. If the line snaps, which they do regularly, you know, it's not uncommon that you lose one. Anybody who's in the snapback zone is going to get decapitated. And it's like, you wouldn't even know it's happened to you. It's like a shot out of a gun. Yeah, yeah. What this technology has done has, it forced us to look at the whole new thing, forced us to say, not 
if it fails so where should people be and it might not fail so we'll do this and we have this procedure for that and there's there's no guarantee that any of that would work so we went from a thinking that said it fails to let's assume that every mooring rope is going to fail every day we need to dissipate that kinetic energy when it does fail the potential energy that's in there it dissipates the kinetic we need to absorb that some way. What is out there that could do that? And we work with a, a German company to do that. And now the mooring lines that we are starting to introduce, and we've trialed them um, and we've seen it, and the new mooring lines go out, actually absorb that. So now when it fails, it still fails. You can't stop a mooring line failing. This mm -hmm. technology does not stop the mooring line failing. What it stops is the massive piece of kinetic energy to a point where it becomes a high consequence outcome. And that's the difference when you talk about risk assessment. If you start talking about risk assessment from a point of view that says it's just going to happen, so you know the only possibility is, is not zero between zero and one anymore, it is one, it is going to happen, what can we do then to mitigate the consequences when it happens? And I think if you look at risk assessment from that point of view, then your solutions and your your prevention, your execution and your recovery measures become a lot more practical and they become a lot more useful to you. Because mm. let's be honest, I mean, you know, even, even, even our view was that, and I will challenge anybody that's listening to this, go back and take a look at your risk assessment. I'm almost guarantee that every one of them's got training of experience of employees as one of your control measures. And that's not a control measure. It's an administrative measure. Definitely. And I, I would say that, you know, I've, I've put them on, on risk assessment not so long ago. I think, um, you know, this, this is how we, 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 we kind of, it's interesting. I don't know if you've ever, if you've been on any of Ron Gant's calls that he's been doing uh, over the, through the coronavirus period, but it's, uh, there's some of them have been absolutely fascinating. And um, it was just last week that actually we were talking about, how we educate safety professionals and it was interesting because essentially we came to a point in my opinion where the, the problem is is that we're having conversations now about like you just said is having you know for example having training and and processes and procedures down on your risk assessments as a, as a control measure is, is not essentially good enough you know and, and and the fact that you've changed your lens on how you've looked at these risk assessments has enabled you to actually essentially eliminate the risk through innovation that was there but you might not have never known about it but we're not trained to really think like that we talk about you want to eliminate first but it's like we, we think about eliminating a risk for a very if for like a tunnel vision you know we, when we say are you going to eliminate the risk it's like well, yeah, I can't get rid of it because I need the mooring lines, for example. It seems that we don't really have, yeah. um, it's like we've got blinders on and we're trained to think that way, I think, anyway. Yeah, no, I, yeah, no, there, there is, right? There's a lot of good things about the education of people in our profession over the last 40 years. And we've come a long way in that space. But the thinking we need today to be educating our you know, young and upcoming people like you, James, against the old, old guys like me who's been around a long time, is there's new ways of dealing with things and there's new ways of thinking. And, you know, if we continue to educate our, our safety teams in old thinking, we're never going to get this, this the, the, the change in mindset, and the change in, uh, in, in um, you know, safety that we want to see. Um, we have to move on. And dinosaurs like John and Conklin and me and Decker and the rest of us, we, we can see that now after 30 years of doing this, right? And we're not advocating, as I said, that you throw everything away, but we're advocating that things need to change. We need to move with the times. And no, you know, the elimination thing is a classic one. You can't eliminate it. You can eliminate it. Just don't put ships on the water, right? You can mm -hmm. stop people. You can eliminate a lot of things, right? Don't get in your car and drive to work. <laughs> you can eliminate um, a lot of, and, and it's like, but guys, you will eliminate your business out of business. You will, you will safety your, your company out of business. That's not what we're here for. Well, yes, we can all achieve zero accidents. Just sack everybody tomorrow, right? doesn't make your workplaces safer. 
It's just a false sense of security. And we need to start thinking about, instead of trying to prevent everything from going wrong, have this view that things will go wrong, accept that failure is inevitable, but manage the consequences. You know, and actually saying, I can't I have, I've eliminated the risk from mooring lines. We haven't, mooring lines still fail. You can't mm. stop that because we can't control the tide. You know, we can't say, you know, we're, not, we're not like King Canoe. We can't sit there and go, sorry, the tide can't come in and out today. That's mm -hmm. controlled by something that we have absolutely no influence over. You know, and, and you go to the, the context in which safety happens is different. You imagine a, a captain of a vessel turning up in a nice, brand new, shiny port in Rotterdam, for example, with all fantastic equipment, highly skilled workforce, automation, everything, still waters, brilliantly designed port. And then he rocks up in a, you know, a small West African country where you've got, you know, um, two guys and a crane and a dock, you know, and a sandbank to pull up to. You know, you can't, his procedures and systems don't work. Mm. So the adaptive nature of, of safety in that point has to be in the context in which you're operating. And that's the problem that we've got in, in, in safety one is that almost everything is on rails has to run for the procedure and people need to keep being told to get back to the procedure, get back to this, get back to that. And, and, and it, it doesn't work anymore because the context has changed. As the context changes, the risks change, the outcomes change. Stop trying to manage things you can't control and focus on the things you can control, which is the consequences of outcomes. How, how do you kind of, how did you deal with, and I suppose this comes back to that, that kind of nine months that you, you were kind of back and to and fro in with the, with the board, but how did you kind of, and interestingly, you, you mentioned that you're having discussions, you've had discussions with regulators and obviously that, that varies. I suspect those, those discussions vary massively i suspect for around the world but hmm. how how do you kind of provide that reassurance kind of before the fact before something happens to the regulator to the board to insurers for example and, and anyone else any kind of other stakeholder to to mess when they're coming in and their their kind of mindset is that i'm going into this business and i want to see risk assessments i want to see checklists i want to see policies procedures training etc the people that are asking say me as a safety manager for all of this stuff like and then for me as a safety manager to turn around and be perceive it to be like well I, we're safety too, mate. We don't do that stuff. Do you know what I mean? Like, how does that kind of conversation come? How do you how do you kind of provide that reassurance? Is it just through time tested and examples like like that more in line one, which is a great example? Yeah, and I, I look in some respects, um, depending on where you are in the world and what you're doing, then um, you know you're gonna you're gonna have to accept that. It, you're going to have to have some form of, uh, of admin. You're going to have to, you know, play the game in that respect yeah. in terms of paperwork, checklists, whatever, right? Uh, until we get um, a total epiphany on, on from our regulators and people in that space who can actually get this and understand what we're trying to do, um, then you're going to still have to have that. Don't, don't think that we're saying, you know, tomorrow you're going to rip up all your textbooks and throw them away. You, it, it really, absolutely, you can't. You know, you, you'll get your organisations into hot water somewhere around the world if you do that. Yeah. But what we're saying is, is that you, you have to take your, your stakeholders, whether they are insurers or regulators or whatever, on a journey that you're going through, but saying, you know, this is how we do this. This is our approach. And be clever enough and smart enough to actually point to things. You know, we talk about, well, how you're writing down your risk assessments. It's like, are you actually doing, and, and, and I challenge this with, with, some, um, with, with some regulators saying, what you're telling me to do is, is do safety work. Yes, but I'm not making the work safer. And yeah, but you need to fill the paper. Yeah, but what, what does that do to stop somebody dying or getting seriously injured? So I can fill in all the pieces of paper you like. The challenge is to find the balance. And this is something that Todd again talks about, that, that was something that I learned from him, which was you're going to have to still do prevention. You're still going to have to do some execution. You're still you're going to have to do some learning and some capacity building to recover when you fail. The challenge is know where your balance is now. Because if you had those sort of 
three things um, in a bucket. What you really want is as a starting point, as a starting point is a third prevention, a third execution, and a third potential to recovery. But be able to flex that in every way. What we do in safety and have done for a long time is even the regulators and our thinking and safety one thinking is all about prevent, 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 prevent. And with some execution. So it's 80% prevention and 20% or maybe 15% execution and then just 5% learning from accidents, right? When stuff goes wrong. And then when stuff goes wrong, we just say, right, let's spend more time working on preventing stuff going wrong. Mm. Whereas this thinking says balance, balance your approach. Yes, there's prevention you're going to have to do, undoubtedly. There are still things that make a lot of sense from, from, from that safety one theory to do to prevent. However, that shouldn't be our only tactic. We need to look at the quality of execution, how work is undertaken, this thing about work in reality versus work as we imagine it. That's execution phase. Understanding that will point you in a different direction. And the last 30% that we're talking about is this ability to say, when things go wrong, we know that we are doing good things that will limit the consequences. It doesn't eliminate, it limits the consequences. Instead of somebody being killed by a snapback mooring line, it might cut their finger. And I'll tell you now, I would take a thousand cut fingers or bruised and twisted ankles for one life every day. And that is completely, you know, sort of, anti Heinrich and anti birds theory that if you eliminate don't believe in that whatsoever you know I just I would take them any day of the week and I'll tell you what you ask the families of the people who have died would you have been happy if your husband brother daughter mother sister would have come home with a, a twisted ankle rather than not coming home they'll take that every day and mm. so would everybody else so let's stop kidding ourselves and stop looking at trying to slot the slips, trips and falls and twisted ankles, cut fingers and bumped heads and start looking at the real big stuff that puts people's lives in danger. Mm. It's fascinating. I, I, I wholeheartedly agree with what you're saying. I think that, that we, we've kind of, we've kind of come like as an in, as a profession, as a profession, I suspect in, in the UK, but also when I'm talking to people in America, they, they seem to be going through the similar thing, but we've hit this plateau of fatalities in the UK where, you know, it's, it's on average, what, 140 for the last five years. And it's like, yeah. there just seems to be this total acceptance of that. Like this, this like, yep, yeah, that's, that's kind of just how it is. Even on the last, I'm, I'm, we did a podcast on it and a video on it uh, just uh, last year on last year's statistics from the HSE. And there's even a comment on there to say um, that there's, a, there's been a slight rise in fatalities. Um, but when, when we look at the statistical uh, kind of analysis of how many more people are working in the UK, it, it, that probably gives us r that the reason why the statistics are going up. And I'm like, no, 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 no. This is not a statistics game. That's like 140 lives have, have, have been lost. Like, I just, I just feel like it, it, I've got no kind of words for it when I think about it. It's like, it, it just infuriates me how we, we've become so accepting of, of fatalities, which essentially is the one thing we're here to stop. I know I understand it's not as simple as me clicking right. my fingers tomorrow or, or sitting on a podcast having a rant about it and then tomorrow everyone's going to go, oh yeah, shit, James is right, let's stop killing people. I understand it's not as similar as that, but there just seems to be this, this horrible right. acceptance of it. Well, because, because we've come to rely and, and in business and everything is, if you, can, if you can measure it, you can manage it, right? That old management mm -hmm. adage that's been around and, and, and we've believed that. You know, um, it's almost become our post-event rationalization argument because, you know, there's another saying that goes statistics, damn lies and statistics, right? Yeah, because you can one. make them read anything, right? Mm -hmm. You know, and, and there's a great book out there called The Tyranny of Metrics. And you can show how our obsession in business with KPIs, metrics and scorecards and delivering those actually, you know, is, is, is drifting us and driving us away from what really matters. I'll give you an example, right? In, um, in, in MESC, we had one year where um, everybody's, everybody was measured individually, everybody had a scorecard, everybody that, 
and at, at a senior level, including me, we all we all got our bonus, right? We all got 100% of our um, of, of our, our target bonus in a year, and yet the company missed its objectives. The company missed its profit objectives. It missed its turnover. It missed its quality targets. It missed its safety targets. But everybody got their bonus because the fascination was on an individual level and people looking after themselves and going, I'm all right, Jack, I can, I can fix my own ear. I can look after myself. I'm all right. My scorecard's green. I get my bonus. So moving away from something that is about, you know, the performance on an individual basis and making it about a collective in terms of the, the sum of everything matters more than one individual. That's really where the difference starts to happen because then you drive a different collaboration thinking, right? That I, you know, before, if it was you and I, then you and I would almost be at odds. Well, I'm not helping James because if I help him and I don't, he can, I mean, to help James achieve his bonus because he's struggling in his areas and his KPIs, then if I help him and he achieves and I miss mine, then, you know, I don't get rewarded for helping you. So you don't drive teamwork. You don't drive collaboration. You don't drive trust. You don't drive those things that you want out of people to actually tell you what's really going on in a business. And I think that's one of the things that, that our, our um, particularly our board and our CHRO is really, really looking at pushing really hard is, is this whole point that it's about what we do as a business that matters, not whether one MD or, or, or one safety person is better than another. It's about, you know what, sometimes people have to self-sacrifice to actually for the greater good of the organization. And, and that's really a different thinking to the way business has been run for a number of years. And I think if we applied more of that to safety, that said that it's not about, you know, this person, that person, this line manager, that department, that division, that particular plant or whatever, and said, this is about how we all help each other. And we, we measure things that matter in terms of how we're helping, how engagement is being lifted how how our people feel cared about then that's more valuable to us right now than measuring absolutely statistics and you know i do agree with you that we've turned people into numbers and one of the things that we have in our philosophy on uh, a, a safety two or whatever you want to call it um, is we have a line item in there that says we we talk about people not numbers and I know that's been around for a long time, but we've somewhere along this journey of safety forgotten about it. This whole make safety personal thing has, has become as twee and as a sort of glib as, you know, um, safety is our number one priority or, you know, we want an accident free workplace and, and everything else. That we've done. They've just become statements that trip off the tongue, but nobody really can then understand what it means. They're just things you say. They're not actions that you take. Mm. Yeah. So it's interesting when, when, when we talk about that stuff, and, and I, I can't get this, this example out of my head when you were talking about uh, kind of building capacity. And when, when we look at these kind of statistics and then we compare that to how we, how we actually act, um, and I think, you know, every year working at high is consistently one of, in the UK, is one of the, the biggest causes to, to fatalities. It's always at the top um, in construction and, and other industries. And it's interesting that we, we still react to that by really not changing much. But we, we look at the guidance and it says, right, you know, if you want to work on a ladder, and just, I'm just going to stick with the examples of a ladder for now, right? If you want to work on a ladder, yeah. it, it should be no more than 30 minutes, right? But then we can look at examples like, you know, horrendous stories like Jason Anker, you know, who, who essentially fell off at a ladder distance height and, and he's changed his, 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 his entire life you know, now for the better, because he's doing amazing, but, you know, he's gone through a horrific journey to get where he is. It was a horrible, horrible incident. And when I think about capacity, I always think about working at height with ladders. And I think, you know, we, we try to eliminate the need for a ladder. We focus so heavily on that, but then we don't build any capacity to actually fall off the ladder and, and kind of to use, to use Todd's phrase to like fail safely. Because 
everyone yeah. looks at it and goes, well, I'm not going to install a, a, a kind of an anchor point in a house and then put a harness on and do all of this just to go up a ladder for five minutes. The likelihood's really, really low. But it's like you genuinely could fall off a ladder and seriously hurt yourself. And statistically speaking, it will happen. Like it will happen. Let's stop working on that position of, yeah. like, of saying that it, that it won't happen and, and just and be like, you know, we're doing, we're doing permits to work for, for working at height. But then what does our permit to work say? It says, well, you can only go on a ladder for 30 minutes. So still 30 minutes with no capacity to fail whatsoever. But that then we deem as acceptable, right? So when you know when when that when that fatality happens as a result of that, and the HSE come along or the inspector comes along or OSHA come along and do this, and they go, you know, oh, show me your bits of paper, right? Uh, the first thing, we had a fatality out in uh, in Toronto, and the first comment that came back from the vessel was, "Don't worry, all the pieces of paper are in order," mm. and it's like. What the hell? You know, it, 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 seriously, you've yeah. just lost the guy overboard doing work at height, as you describe. And no, it's not falling off a ladder, but it was very similar. Mm. And the message that comes back was, "We've got all the bits of paper in order." And I think that's the problem in, in, in that we've we we we've, we've sort of developed into this um, litigious nature, and 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 that. Uh, it's okay that we can justify that somebody's lost a life because we've done everything we can. We, we sort of hear, you know, oh, you know, pity island. We, what more could we have done? Well, the answer is you could probably do a lot more. And if, if my view of this is if you'd spend a lot more, a lot less time actually trying to write processes, procedures, and, and actually, you know, uh, if you like, prevent everything from happening and understand the challenges of that, that girl or that guy climbing that ladder and ask them, how, if you're going to fall, what, what can help you, right? Mm. And it's like, well, this, or do that, or tie that, or do whatever. And sometimes it's as, as simple as low cost or no cost even. You don't have to have these massive systems to do this. People are going to say, oh, yes, Kevin, that's easy to say. But I, I could point to you for a number of examples over the years uh, of, of where the insight that comes from the people doing the job is often – you know the the best the best and most obvious solution. I think I think you call it like Occam's razor or something like that, right? Which is, you know, the 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 the, the obvious answer is normally the the right one, and and that's where we've forgotten. We've we've tried to think or, sorry, we, we've 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 put people in a mindset that they're stupid, right? And they need controlling. And the only people who can control them are people who are a little bit more intelligent because we have a little bit. At, better access to education, we've had a better upbringing, or we've had more, more opportunities, and that makes us better than them. And mm. to do that, then we must know the right things to do. They, they're stupid, and they just need to be told what to do. And when it goes wrong, it's their fault. And that's where we've got to in safety. It's a, I know it's a, I'm being provocative for a reason, James, because I think that's how, you know, when I looked at safety, and I saw and, and my own experiences over the last 30 years, that's how I view it now. And until you change that view, that the, the, go on, carry on. Yeah, sorry, mate. Um, yeah, I, until you change that view that says this is not um, a people problem, that it's a, a work problem, and it's the design of work and the reality of work that we need to check. And actually, our people get the job done almost despite the challenges that we put in their way. You know, we sometimes ask our people to to run the 100 meters with their legs tied together. And guess mm. what? They still do it for us. But when they didn't do it in 9.9 .9 seconds and did it in 10.1 seconds, we don't thank them for running with, or despite all the challenges and hurdles and banana skins and ropes that we tie around them, we still criticize them. You know, <laughs> I mean, talk about, you know, distrust and motivation. Yeah. And, and I think that's a, that's a huge problem with the way that, that really say looks at people today. Definitely. And, and in, in, in kind of response to your comment about being provocative, I, I, I really don't mind. If I'm honest, I invite the more, the more provocative, the better. And I would even go a bit further to say that I, I think that we create stupidity. I think a lot of people call it, we talk about learned helplessness a lot. And I, I've heard that a lot, but 
I, I don't I don't think we should call it learned helplessness. I think we should call it learned stupidity because I think people can help themselves. They can they can demand better. But I think you, we we create stupid people. Like look when you get in your car, you you, you finish this call for example, and you're gonna you're gonna jump in a car to jump down to Tesco and, and stand in an extremely long queue with your face mask on. You get in the car, the car beeps at you because your tires are not at the, the, the right pressure you set them up. Your car beeps at you because your windscreen water's run out. Your car beeps at you because you're driving too fast. Your car beeps at you because you're too close to the, the car in front, you know, and then you've got lane assist. Depending on how expensive your car was, you can go on forever and forever and actually in essence, what we've done is we've, we've taught people now to stop focusing on the risk themselves because they're so used to the car doing everything for them that they're just like, cool, it's safe. And I think we do exactly the same in work. You know, we, we go and how many times do we kind of employ someone because we, we want James to come and work at this business because he's so innovative and he's got a real nice new way of looking at things. And then you bring him into the business and then he starts fixing this machine and you go, whoa, whoa, James, what are you doing? I'm, I'm fixing the machine. Yeah, but that's not how the procedure says to fix it. So can you fix it to the procedure, please? And within a year's time, you've now got a clone of the same stupid shit that you were trying to fix in the first place. And it's like, you know, we, we create stupidity with, with a lot of our kind of strict stand, uh, kind of strict uh, rules and procedures. And we just end up in this perpetual cycle of, of just not getting anywhere, really. I think that's, that there is some truth in that, absolutely. And I... I I would call it, we, we, we beat the innovation and creativity out of people for compliance. Definitely. What do I mean by that? Exactly as you described it, right? Is that we employ, we try and employ the smartest people, um, the best people who have got motivation, enthusiasm, or want to change and want to do things differently. And the first thing you do is you beat it out of them because they won't comply because they're different. And that's not, you know, that's because they're different to us. I think there's a lot more we have to be accepting of you know, individuals and the diversity of thought and everything that, that, that's around this. We've talked a good game for way too long in industry around, you know, our people are our greatest asset and we love diversity. Yeah, diversity is fantastic. When you enable people to bring that in and you give them the chance and the psychologically safe environment to screw up from time to time. Exactly. You know, if, if you're going to criticize them and punish them every time they, they try something new and fail, what are they going to do, right? They're going to stop doing it. And then you're right. You just end up in this, in, 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 in this ridiculous situation where you are beating the innovation and creativity out of people because they won't comply with the old ways. And this is where safety is the same, right? We still put people through induction. This is what you do. This is how you do it, you know. The, the, the point is, for me, I mean, if you took something simple as, as just induction, then what do you need to know, guys? You know, you're being employed here. If you're not brand new to the industry or whatever, then, okay, we're going to tell you some, some basic stuff around who we are and what we lift, and what we do for a living. Um, and you ask them the question, so if something's going to go wrong, what do you think you're going to need? And they'll go, well, okay, I can do this. We do induction on day one. My view, my view is you should do induction after like a month or three months and go, okay, um, you've seen the job, you've done that, you've had some experiences, what do you think? And let's induct you now and ask you what you think can do to make the job better. You know, and, and yet because we are conditioned and this is the old way and you know, the urban myths and how you do things, we're frightened to change, right? We're frightened to change because we, we've got this, this, this spectre of the regulator over our shoulder looking at us going, I'm gonna catch you out, I'm gonna get you, you know, if you don't play the game, I'm going to get you. And that, cre that prevents our creativity as safety people. It prevents our thinking because it limits our risk-taking personas that we all have inside us, right? Mm. We all make different calls every day on risk. Don't tell me that you all, you know, run across the road when the, uh, when, when the, uh, the, the pedestrian crossings on green because there's no cars coming, right? You know, we all do that. We all make those judgments every day. And yet in our own little world, we, we, we have this view that because we're safety people, we're not allowed to take risks, right? We're not, we are allowed to take risks. We are allowed to be innovative and creative and step out of our comfort zone. We are allowed to try new things and fail. What we want to do is fail in a way that doesn't result in a high consequence outcome. 
Mm. You know, I mean, not everything we've done in Maersk or in before that in Vodafone or the terminals business worked, but at least we tried it. And, and I think the biggest, the biggest crime that we commit as safety people is just hanging on, you know, hanging on with our fingernails to the past because we've used this for 30 years and, and, and you know, ignore or bury our head in the sand around innovation, technology and new thinking and creativity is something that is holding us back as a profession. Yeah, definitely. It's funny you should say about the, uh, you know, a lot of people think that the safety professionals are like uber boring because we, we just don't ever take any risk and we live, we live our lives like, like, oh, you can't come in my house until you've, you've gone through an induction. But a lot of the safety professionals that I've come across over the years, have got some of the, like the most riskiest hobbies from like mountain bikers to rock climbers to uh, shark divers and, and scuba divers. And I, I know safety professionals that just love taking risk and i think it comes down to they're the ones that really understand that kind of risk appetite that kind of like well i, I am essentially taking a risk by climbing up this this mountain or whatever with just my bloody whatever kind of protection device i've got but like they've gone through that they understand safety to its nth degree that it's not about the paperwork that they're creating safety as they're climbing up that mountain face or, you know, as you're mountain biking, you're creating safety by making dynamic decisions in a dynamic environment. I always use, like I played rugby for a long time and, um, and I always use that as an example of a risk assessment as a full back, I'd catch the ball right at the back. And within that second, boom, I'm doing a risk assessment. What, what's my decision is, am I kicking the ball because of where we are on the pitch? Am I running the ball because the, the guy in front of me is a real slow prop? Or is the guy in front of me this big, nasty center that I think could really just break my ribs? And I think, oh, I don't want to do that. I'm going to kick the ball or I'm going to pass the ball or something like that. We, we, we do these, these things because I think we, we get what safety should be. I think, I think that, that essentially is what it but it's interesting that people have this perception of us like the amount of banter i get if i ever missed a tackle someone would be oh what did you do risk assess that and, and decide not to tackle him and it's like oh god it's infuriating <laughs> <laughs> yeah now there's there's a there's yeah there's there's an awful lot of people who um do have some um, very very um exciting extracurricular activities i'm sure and you know what we, we if if we're taking the excitement out of life what's the point of being alive right yeah, there's, there's more to life than, 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 than just just surviving and, and mm. i think that's uh, um that, that's a very very good one i like the analogy by the way the rugby analogy is a very a very good one um yeah really 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 interesting mm. So this, this kind of, you, you, the way you talk about this is, is, is you kind of talk about it like it's a journey that, that you were on with Mass together. Um, and I remember from your keynote, you kind of said that you were like probably about halfway through this kind of journey. I'll be interested to see, you know, what, what's your kind of predicted timeline on this? Is there a predictive timeline? And how did you come up with that? And how do you kind of know that you're halfway through? And, 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 and how will you know when you get to the end as well would be really interesting. Well, it's a good question. Um, I think the first thing is that this is a transformation and it's, um, and anybody who, who embarks on wanting to do things differently because they're dissatisfied with the, the, their current state or where they are, or, you know, whether they're still killing and injuring too many people, or they're just having that uncertain feeling around safety. The first decision here is that, look, this is a, this is a transformation. It's not a program. It's not something that you arrive at one point and then a year later you arrive at another point because you've changed something. You transform first by sort of framing the transformation. What is it we want to be? Where do we want to go? And that takes as long as it takes. And in our case, that took nine months. It wasn't, as I said, we didn't say tomorrow we're going to do safety too. It was, what do we want to be? What's wrong with where we are? Why do we want to change? How could we change? What might it look like? How long might it take us? We don't know. So you frame the transformation. And, and then once you've done that, you have to prepare your organization for success. And then this is, this is sort of called activating the transformation. The second phase you get into, whenever you've got that framing agreed and set and you've lined up your, your, your senior leadership commitment and your organization for this, there's then a next setup phase, which is called activating it. 
You know, you don't go from your board saying yes to implementation on day two. What, what happens is you go through what, what are the what conditions, what resources, what support, what frameworks, how do we do this? You have to develop the how. And to do that, there are a lot of things. And that took us another sort of year to develop that, that frame, that, that, that activate. How do we make this come alive? And so we have really in 2020, albeit slightly sort of, you know, hindered by something that went on in the world earlier this year, um, we started to, to enter what, what we call the sort of gaining execution momentum phase. What does that mean? It means that the things that you want to achieve, that you set out in the framing, you start to do things that make that possible, that outcome a possibility. And that is where you really, your organization starts to change how it thinks and works. And that's where that we are never going to be in this phase. And there's no rule that says you tick this box and does whatever. You know it's the right time to move to phase four when you're seeing enough momentum. And, and, and what, what our, we have a great guy in Mesco who runs our um, IT and our transformation business. And he calls it, you know, gaining escape velocity. And getting to the next phase, when you get in this third phase of, of gaining execution momentum, you have to get enough momentum to get into the next phase. And that's the escape velocity. And that's different. You, know, you can't just tick a box and go, we've done these three things, we automatically move on. It takes as long as it takes. And that's dependent upon a lot of things that I can't tell you. You know, I can, I can help you judge where you are and what's needed and what might help you build that escape velocity. But there is no you do A, B, C formula and then D comes out at the end of it because it's contextual. It's about your organization, your people, your appetite, your, 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 your daily context. You know, talking to some organizations today about, um, yeah, you know, gaining execution momentum and the back of um, nearly four months of COVID lockdown and survival. It's pointless because the world's changed, right? And, and, and that's, the, that's the difference. So... Is there a formula, there's a framework you could use and it is a transformational framework. Phase four is really when you start to see things get embedded and become business as usual. And then phase five, which is somewhere down the line, is, is all about, it's just the way we work around here. Which is, you know, you'll remember that from a lot of people talking about culture generally. The, the, it's in your DNA and how you put it together. So, yeah, I mean, we are in the early days of um, phase three, where the organization is starting to do some things. The actual time and, uh, and how long we're going to be in phase three, who knows? It depends on appetite of leaders the effectiveness of some of the stuff that we've designed and developed some of the thinking that we might have to go back over and redo um so i, I don't know is the answer i can't i can't really tell you how long we're going to be all we will know is when we have got enough momentum to reach that escape velocity and that's really what we're looking for when you said what does it look like when you're finished it depends because if you're looking for something that you want to achieve when you set out uh, you might be disappointed because as you go on this journey, you learn all the time. You're learning about yourself. You're learning about your organization. You're learning about how to do this. And I'll be honest with you, I don't expect the actual achievements or the way we measure success when we do we get eventually get into phase five uh, to look anything like the ambition that when we started it. Mm. Now, and that would normally be like blasphemy and we'd all be fired as a result of it. The realization here is that this is a learning journey you go on, and as the context and the things you can't can't really change around you change, it's how you react to the changes and how you influence your own thinking in relation to that. If you want to run on rails, I'll guarantee you you will achieve your objectives, but I can't guarantee you that you would have done anything to actually make the world of work a safer place. That's my philosophy and view on this. So agility adaptability, resilience, being flexible. You know, if you talk to Todd, Todd's got these boundaries. He has this wonderful slide that he always shows. He's got these two wavy lines on it and this gray area in the middle. That's the reality is that boundaries constantly move. 
and, and yet we in the safety world continue to think that you know we work in a fixed square rigid system and that you know tomorrow it's going to be exactly the same as today as it was yesterday as it was a week ago and it's not the reality is that things are different today they're going to be different tomorrow and they're going to look even more different next week and having systems that are flexible agile adaptable responsive and can meet the needs of the people in the organization right now that's what matters not to say that they are you know going to meet them next week or next year we might have to change them but it is this constant evolution so it is almost like a bit like you know when when you get when apple bring out a new phone it's never perfect right and then they do software release number 14 or 14.1 or then there's an upgrade that's what we need to keep doing with safety is actually go we have a minimum viable product here that we're going to launch and you know what we know it's not right we know it's not going to meet the customer's needs in a year or two years time but what we will do is we will keep adapting and releasing upgrades to our program how many upgrades do we keep releasing we don't we still you know and, and fundamentally ios is the same today as it was when it was launched way back when in whatever it was 2003 or whatever it was it's the same fundamentals, just the same as Windows is the same fundamentals today. In safety, we keep wanting to reinvent things instead of actually going, these things work, keep doing the iterations and release. And safety too, to me, is just another iteration. It is an agile product based upon a great start for 70 years that was safety one. But just keeping Windows 3.1 is not going to deal with what you need to run today. You ain't going to run all your apps on 3. Windows 3.1. You want something that's better than that. I'm sorry I'm talking sort of mixed metaphors and all sorts of things. I'm trying to make it relatable for people who will get it, you know. And, and I think that's the difference what Safety 2 is trying to talk about is this flexibility, adaptability, um, and a, ability to react to the consequence without major consequences. Um, and, and whereas I think safety one is much more about rigidity and running on rails and compliance against the fixed ideology. And I think that is the biggest shift in my mind that I've had over 10 years is that, you know, we accepting that failure is inevitable, that human error is inevitable and focus on building capacity for when things go wrong not focusing on the justifying why we don't have to put this control measure in because so that the actual probability of it going wrong is small mm -hmm. i think that's the completely different thinking that we need for the future i liked all the metaphors it, it, to give you some feedback i thought i'm, I'm a man that likes uh, likes varying examples and i think i think it's nice to hear it explained like that as well and I, and I also quite like the way you, you, you talk about from safety one to safety two, that essentially it's that kind of software update. You know, we don't, we don't look at a software update on our phones or on our laptops as a negative thing. But yet in the safety industry, we've got this massive divide where there's, there's like a, a huge percentage of the industry or the profession, to use a better word, that look at this update as a really negative thing. It's like a challenge. And, and I think it's important, like you quite rightly did, in yeah. my opinion, was, was acknowledging where that safety, that original traditional safety one, whatever we're going to call it, has got us to a position. And it's done a phenomenal work over the last, like you say, 70 years. You know, you know, we, we're not sending kids under machines anymore. We're not killing thousands and thousands of people every year. You know, we've got it down to 140. And whilst there's still a lot of work to do, we've done a lot of work. And I think sometimes maybe the Safety 2 community fail to acknowledge that. And, and we could probably do a little bit better there by a little bit of a hat tip, I think. Yeah, I, I, I don't. I don't disagree with James. I think the other problem is that there's there's a lot of um, and and again, excuse my provocative nature on this. Uh, standing back and watching, if you like, the infighting that I've seen amongst our profession on this, it's embarrassing. Um, mm. You know, I, I, it, there's a lot of if you like intellectual egos that are saying not invented here, emperor's new clothes. Who cares, right? I thought we were in this profession because. We wanted, you know, we shared a few that people getting injured and killed at work is not a good thing. 
you know, you didn't come into this profession because you wanted to get super rich because, or you wanted to be the, you know, the, the, uh, the most liked person in the world. You came into this profession because if you reflect on why you did it, because it touched something inside you. And, you know, it, it, it's actually something that, that is a moral fiber that you have in this profession. And it annoys me when I'm all for professional disagreements and views, but not to the detriment of the people we're supposed to be here to serve and support, mm -hmm. which are those people, those girls, those guys that actually put their lives on the line every day for, for us to earn money. That is just wrong, in my opinion. We should stop it now, get behind something and go for it. Definitely. I would wholeheartedly agree. And uh, my camera's flashing at me telling me it's going to run out of battery. So there's a great time to probably tie it in a loop there, considering that was a great place to finish. And uh, thank you very much, Kevin. I, I assume a great place to kind of you, find out any more information would be Mesh's YouTube channel. I had a look a couple of weeks ago. It's quite impressive. There's a lot on there. Is there, is there anywhere else that we could uh, kind of find out any more? Um, I think that's a great place to start. Read, read the MERS sustainability report. You know, you can see it tells you from 18 and from 19. It tells you it starts to show you in 18 how we're framing the transformation and what we're going to do. And then last year we started to talk about how we we were gaining momentum and activating it and getting it alive. And you'll notice in there that yes, we talked about accidents in in 18, but last year we didn't at all. And we talked about all the ways we were building capacity, what we were doing with our leaders, what we were doing with our employees. And, and long may that continue. Uh, but there, go there, go to the YouTube channel, follow us on, on, follow the company on LinkedIn, go and talk to them about what they're doing. Watch the videos uh, because they, we don't separate safety from our business. That's the other thing. So the all the way videos that you'll see out there and the stuff we're doing is all about what we believe in as the organization, not just for safety. Yeah. And you'll see uh, my, my picture's completely froze. My camera's just died. But I am you, still here. Because your camera's died. Yeah, I am still here. I'm still listening. Okay. I've, I've built capacity to fail. I knew it was going to go. But Good boy. Could continue. Yes, you see. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, so I'll, I'll drop all the links to those in the description, the YouTube channel. I'll have a look for the sustainability report. I'll put that in the link as well so people can pick that up. Um, but otherwise, thank you very much, Kevin. That was a great chat. No worries. Thanks, James. I enjoyed it. Thanks. And have a, a wonderful Wednesday. I will. Okay, peeps. Hope you enjoyed that conversation. I enjoyed it. I hope you did. I really enjoy it. I hope you are well. I didn't ask you that at the beginning. I hope you are well. I hope you are dealing with this second lockdown better than I. <laughs> it's, uh, it's definitely a challenge on our mental resilience. I find it a bigger challenge on our kind of cognitive capacity is what I kind of keep calling it. Like I have to think all the time. And that's hard work, man. So I hope you're dealing well with it. If you're not, feel free to come and connect with us on social media and I'll show, we can therapize each other. We can talk to each other and help help each other out. You can find me on LinkedIn, James McPherson. Come find us, Rebranding Safety, on LinkedIn, on Facebook, and on Twitter, but it's special Twitter is, so it's called Rebranded Safety, as in we've done it, you know, been there, done that. That's what that's all about. We've also got Instagram, but we're not doing much on there, if I'm honest. I started it a few weeks ago, I'm struggling to keep up with all these social media stuff, I'm struggling to keep up, really, full stop. <laughs> anyway, this is not this is not a therapy session, James, you know, get hold of yourself. I hope you enjoyed that conversation. Make sure you listen next week for my reflection on the chat with Kim Furnish. You get some behind the scenes and you can work out what we can, you can, you can hear what my favourite points are. You can find out what I thought about some of the stuff Kevin said. Um, and my upgraded approach on safety one and safety two as it evolves every week through listening to these episodes so make sure you check out next week if you enjoyed this episode share it give it a rate and a re review if you're on uh, itunes um, they really help so thank you very much for those of you who've done it and if you do that screenshot it let us know on the old social medias as well i oh, shall stop waffling on now people catch you next week safe the views and opinions expressed in this podcast are those of the host and its guests and do not necessarily reflect the position of the companies. Examples of analysis discussed within this podcast are examples only based on limited and dated open source information and should not be utilised in real life as the only solution available. Assumptions made within this analysis are not reflective of the position of the companies. 
No part of this podcast may be reproduced, stored or transmitted in any form or by any means, mechanical, electronic or otherwise, without prior written permission from James McPherson. (laughs) 